It's so great to be here at the Studio School. I, I think at least part of the reason I'm here is, is thanks to a, a, a dear friend I know of the Studio School and of mine, Bill Corbett. Um, uh, I know he was speaking here late last year um, about uh, John Walker, uh, who's a friend of his and, and, and of mine, and uh, I was sorry to miss it. I was still in Australia um, for a kind of sabbatical year last year. Bill's no longer with us, sadly, um, but I just wanted to salute him before I start and, and uh, I guess just to, to say, you know, not only that he was a great friend, but, but such a great inspiration, um, both from his poetry, which I think is absolutely wonderful and underrated, and also his nonfiction, not only his kind of um, incredible memoir, Furthering My Education, uh, heartbreaking book but also his wonderful writing about art. Um, we had many conversations about a friend of his, Philip Guston, um, and about John Walker um, and many other artists. And you know, he was one of the people who really encouraged me to write about, about Freud and Bacon, who I'll be talking about tonight. So it just felt important to acknowledge Bill. Um, as I said, thanks so much for coming. And, and it really is a, a, an honor to be here, a real pleasure. So, Without further ado, I'll start talking about some of these uh, pictures and try and tell a bit of a story about them. Uh, Lucien, can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Yes. Terrific, that is great. Um, Lucien Freud's portrait of Francis Bacon was completed in 1952. It was stolen from the Neue Nationale Gallery in Berlin 36 years later, and it hasn't been seen since. A visitor to the Berlin Museum was the first to notice and report the work's absence. Police tried to seal the building, but it was too late. The gallery's director and staff were embarrassed. There'd been no security to speak of. It had all been too easy. A small reward was offered. Uh, ports and airports were alerted. A couple of tip-offs were pursued, but it was all to no avail. The thief had used a screwdriver to remove the picture from the wall. No ransom demand ever materialized. Yes. A little bit more, absolutely, of course. Let's just move it up a little bit. Is that a little better? Yes, okay, good. One thing, however, was widely noted. When the picture was stolen, the museum had been filled with students. And in Germany at that time, the subject of the painting, Francis Bacon, was much better known than Freud, particularly among students and young art lovers. He was known as one of the 20th century's uh, most vivid personalities, and he had what almost amounted to a cult following. Freud, on the other hand, was a stranger to most Germans, even art lovers. Only his family name, he was of course the grandson of Sigmund Freud, was familiar. So, perhaps it was one of the students who stole it, or several working together. When the art critic Robert Hughes tried to console Freud with the thought that the theft was a perverse kind of compliment, someone had evidently loved his painting enough to steal it, Freud disagreed. I don't think so, he said. I think somebody out there really loves Francis. The portrait was in Berlin for a retrospective of Freud's work organized by the British Council. Freud was 66 at that time, and yet this was his first big show uh, held outside Great Britain. 13 years later, the Tate, which owned the portrait and had lent it to Berlin, was gearing up for another major retrospective of Freud's work. By this time, Freud was 79. He had a feeling that it might be the last major show devoted to him during his lifetime. Naturally, both he and the gallery wanted the best possible sampling of his work. The portrait of Bacon was crucial in this sense. It was just a tiny thing, a mere seven inches by five. Freud had painted it on a small piece of copper while sitting knee to knee with Bacon over a three month period. It showed Bacon head on and from very close in. Everyone thought of him as a blur, Freud would later say, but he had a very specific face. I remember wanting to bring Bacon out from behind the blur. The picture marked a vital breakthrough in Freud's early work. So, what if it could somehow be retrieved? There was reason to think it might be possible. Under the German statute of limitations, a crime of this kind can't be prosecuted after 12 years. So the hope was that the thief or thieves, especially if they were students who had acted more or less on impulse, could be enticed into returning the painting without fear of penalty. A publicity ca campaign was planned. Freud himself was signed up. He designed a striking poster with wanted 
in bold red lettering and stolen in smaller letters below. Well, I think the English version had stolen, or his original sketch for it. Um, there was also a generous reward. It was still in the days of Deutschmark. Um, 2,500 of these posters were plastered all over Berlin and widely reproduced in newspapers and magazines. Freud even put out a statement to the press. Would the person who holds the painting kindly consider allowing me to show it in my exhibition next June, he said, <laughs> um, with uncharacteristic sort of deference. All great paintings, you could say, have an aura which derives in part from their singularity. When the painting in question is a portrait, certainly if it's a good one, its aura may be enhanced just because the singularity of the image is matched by the singularity of the person depicted. So a stolen portrait can amount to a confusing kind of double loss. You can strive to orchestrate its return, but what exactly is it one wants to retrieve? The painting, the person, or the time during which it was painted? In his own portraiture, Lucien Freud always seemed determined to treat these two kinds of singularity as one. My idea of portraiture, he once said, came from dissatisfaction with portraits that resembled people. I would wish my portraits to be of the people, not like them, he said, not having a look of the sitter, being them. It was as if he was determined to reenact the myth of Pygma Pygmalion, the mythical sculptor who fell in love with the sculpture he'd carved. Well, in any case, it didn't work. The Tate retrospective went ahead without the portrait, but for many years, Freud kept the wanted poster prominently at the entrance to his studio. It was the last thing he saw before entering each day, before getting on with his work. The stolen portrait of Bacon shows him head on and from close in. Bacon's eyes are cast down, though not to the floor. They have a, a pensive, far away look, a suggestion of almost inward retreat. Robert Hughes described the picture as having the silent intensity of a grenade in the millisecond before it goes off. Freud went on to become famous, of course, for the fleshy amplitude of his pictures and for his use of thick, oily paint, lavishly applied. But in 1952, when he painted Bacon, he specialized in surface tension. Working on a small scale, he kept the paint as smooth as possible, no visible brush strokes. Control was paramount. So was a kind of almost Flemish evenness of attention maintained across the entire surface of his pictures. Even so, the contrast between the left and right sides of Bacon's head is odd and becomes more remarkable the longer you study it. The right, his right, cast lightly in shadow is a, a sort of study in placidity. Over on the left, however, everything's slipping and skidding about. An S-shaped lick of hair, you can count the strands, casts a dashing shadow on Bacon's brow. The whole left side of his mouth twists upwards, triggering a, a pouchy swelling at the corner of his mouth. A sheen of sweat shines from that side of his nose. Even the left ear seems to squirm. Most striking of all, and it's really the engine that powers the whole portrait, is the way Bacon's left eyebrow extends its powerful arabesque into the furrow at the center of his forehead. It's a conceit that has nothing to do with realism, if you take that term literally, but it animates the whole picture. You could see why Freud, who usually claimed not to care about the whereabouts of his pictures, cared about this one and wanted it back for his show. As much as anything, it was a question of quality. But I think it's lost mattered to Freud for another, more personal reason. Very simply, it represented the most important relationship in his career. Freud had first met Bacon when they were introduced by the older painter Graham Sutherland. Bacon was 35, more than a decade Freud's senior. Bacon, who was in his early 30s, was surging to life in these years. He was producing paintings, including a breakthrough work of a man in the shadow of an umbrella, which was the first picture Freud saw in his studio, that had already set him apart. Troubled and troubling works, in which alert observers saw something almost reptilian stirring to life, full of menace. The two men, Bacon and Freud, soon began to see each other on a daily basis, a routine that lasted not just a week or a year, but well over a decade. 
Still in his early 20s, Freud was living in a condemned building in Paddington at the time. He was a mercurial young man, attracted by danger, and to most people who encountered him, extremely attractive. His famous family had escaped Hitler's Germany thanks to high-level intercessions in 1933. When he first arrived, speaking no English, Lucien largely kept to himself. Wild and secretive, he had a fierce aversion to other people's expectations of how one should behave. He loved to draw. His drawings were cramped, fanciful, and childlike. He had two brothers, but he was his mother's favorite, and he knew it. I like the anarchic idea of coming from nowhere, he once said, but I think that's probably because I had a very steady childhood. His family connection to the founder of psychoanalysis undoubtedly enhanced his allure, but the effect Freud had on most people was not at all social, much less intellectual. It was visceral. The critic Lawrence Gowing recognized in him a, quote, coiled vigilance, a sharpness in which one could imagine venom. Bacon's childhood was different. Born in 1909, he was the second of five children. Like Freud, he had a famous ancestor, the great Elizabethan chancellor and philosopher after whom he was named. His father, Eddie Bacon, was a retired army captain who ran the household along military lines. Francis spent long stretches of his childhood with his maternal grandmother in another part of Ireland. But when living with his parents, and despite chronic and severe asthma, he was made to go pony riding at every opportunity. And for days afterwards, he'd be bedridden, struggling for breath. Captain Bacon wanted to make a man of his sickly son, and so he regularly arranged for the grooms he employed to horsewhip him. Francis liked to trail these same grooms around, and in his early teens, he had his first sexual experiences with them. After his father caught him dressing up in women's clothes, Bacon was cast out of the house. He ended up in London after stints in Paris and Berlin, and set out on a short-lived career as an interior designer. He lived with his old nanny, Jessie Lightfoot. She spent much of the day knitting at the back of Bacon's studio and slept at night on the kitchen table. She was very nearly blind, and yet, in the broader sense, she looked out for Bacon. She helped him to cook, she was not above shoplifting if the situation called for it, and she helped him organize roulette parties, which at that time were against the law. She was also a gatekeeper for Bacon's love life. Using Francis Lightfoot as his pseudonym, Bacon placed ads offering his services as a gentleman's companion uh, in the personal columns in the Times. When the replies came in, it was Nanny Lightfoot who made the selections. Her criteria were financial. One of these gentlemen was called Eric Hall, a high-powered businessman. He had a wife and family, but after years of uh, staying intermittently with Bacon and his nanny, he eventually left them. And the three members of this unlikely menage took a lease on the ground floor flat in a building at Cromwell Place. Freud visited Bacon's Cromwell Place studio almost daily. What went on there astonished him. Bacon was snapping British modernism out of its complacent, literary, <coughs> neo-romantic past and bringing it into line with a new world scarred by war and hollowed out by a sense of existential futility. Bacon himself must have been almost as astonished. For years he'd been dabbling first with upscale modern furniture design and then with mediocre paintings in a, in a cubist and surrealist vein. It was only in 1944, the year before his first meeting with Freud, that he had broken through to something strange and troubling, a painted triptych he called <clears throat> Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion. I should just uh, pour some water here, excuse me. I'm sorry I don't have that image. Um, the figures in question were hideous, humped, hairless shapes with open maws, bandaged or non-existent eyes, long necks and tapering legs. Bacon's imagination was responsive not just to the expected modernist stalwarts imported from the continent, but to a whole new image bank provided by photography and film and mass media. Ever since he'd seen Eisenstein's battleship Potemkin and Fritz Lang's Metropolis in Berlin, and acquired a medical textbook illustrating diseases of the mouth with photographs. He'd been obsessed by the speed and 
discontinuity of those very modern media, the way they hinted at loss, disruption, and death. Freud was awed as much by Bacon's approach to his work as by the imagery he came up with. Bacon described his breakthrough work, painting, as a series of, uh, sorry, quote, a series of accidents mounting on top of each other. If anything ever does work in my case, he said elsewhere, it works from that moment when consciously I don't know what I'm doing. It's uh, easy to imagine the electrifying effect this kind of talk must have had on Freud. His own work, for all its gnarly satisfactions and fascinations, was still naive. He'd been painting portraits and still lifes, prickly studies of asymmetrical objects, all subjected to his intense hawk-like scrutiny. His drawing was fastidious and stylized. His most powerful painting was a still life of a dead bird, a heron, splayed out on a flat surface. Every feather of its disheveled plumage accorded its own distinct shade of gray. He was fascinated both by Bacon's risky theatrical approach and his utter lack of sentimentality about his own efforts. He'd often destroy them before they left the studio. Just as important was Bacon's visceral love of oil paint. He handled paint with an urgency that at this stage was entirely absent from Freud's own careful filling in between the lines. There was something, something chancy and erotic about it. Freud was beguiled. I realized immediately, he said later, that Bacon's work related immediately to how he felt about life. Mine, on the other hand, seemed very labored. But what affected Freud just as powerfully as Bacon's work was his attitude to life. He had a, an expansiveness, a generosity, a way of negotiating people and situations that came as a revelation to Freud. His work impressed me, he said, but his personality affected me. In Soho, where they usually met at night, Freud marveled at how Bacon gathered people around him, deploying his charm, which seemed to have something volcanic about it something indiscriminate. Freud would later call Bacon, quote, the wisest and wildest person he ever knew. Inevitably, their friendship aroused jealousy in Eric Hall, who came to loathe Freud. Uh, Freud's friend and early lover, Anne Dunn, would later claim that Freud, quote, had a kind of hero-worshipping crush on Bacon, but she didn't think it was ever consummated. What seems undeniable is that the relationship was not only intense, but asymmetrical. Bacon was attracted to Freud, but indifferent, or so it seemed in any case, to his work. Freud, on the other hand, for one of the only times in his life, was truly enthralled to another person. Influence, you could say, is erotic. It's impossible to lay out neatly. It has nothing clinical or rational about it. Freud was young, and he was surely susceptible, and yet, what seems clear is that even as he admitted Bacon's example, he now found himself caught up in a struggle to hold true to his own course. He registered immediately not only what he was drawn to in Bacon, but what distinguished them. Bacon, he later said, talked about packing a lot of things into one single brushstroke, which amused and excited me. And I knew, he said, it was a million miles from anything I could ever do. The pressure on Freud through these years was intense. For all the interest his work generated, nothing he was doing was in any way revolutionary. Whereas what Bacon was doing was, or at least it seemed to be, his approach was the complete antithesis of Freud's. Where Freud labored over his portraits for weeks and months, Bacon's painting relied on stealth and surprise. Through a combination of chance and high emotion, fury, frustration, despair, he saw himself unlocking what he called valves of sensation. He spoke of feelings of hopelessness, blurting out that he would, quote, do almost anything to get out of the formula of making a kind of illustrative image. He would wipe the painting all over with a rag or throw turpentine and paint onto the canvas just so that it would grow more spontaneously. In 1946, the war finally over, Freud went to Paris, where he was introduced to Pablo Picasso. And the following year, he met Kitty Garman, 
The young couple married and lived together in St. John's Wood, and Freud began a series of portraits of Kitty, some in pastel, others in oil. Coming within two years of Freud's first encounter with Bacon, these portraits announce a new ambition in his work and a, a sudden intensification of feeling. They seem almost to quiver, generating and somehow containing a psychological pressure that was new in Freud's work. The pressure derives in part, you suspect, from the effort Freud was putting in not to be blown off course by Bacon. At mid-century, Bacon was entering his most fertile, innovative period. Where Freud spent weeks and months on a portrait, Bacon talked during these years about images being handed to him, ready-made, dropping into his mind, one after the other, like slides. He was enjoying his first public successes, attracting the attention of galleries, critics, and fellow artists. Inspired by Diego Velazquez, he was painting variations of the Spaniard's famous portrait of Pope Innocent X. His ambition, he said, was to paint like Velazquez, but with the texture of a hippopotamus skin. He became obsessed with wide open mouths, screams, snarls, both human and animal. He saw no distinction. And he returned to these motifs again and again. I like the glitter and color that comes from the mouth he said, and I've always hoped in a sense to be able to paint the mouth like Monet painted a sunset. Freud made three drawings of Bacon in 1951. They show Bacon with his shirt undone, his hips thrust forward, his pants suggestively undone at the fly and folded down to reveal a vulnerable belly. According to Freud, Bacon himself had adopted the pose, saying, I think you ought to do this because I think it's rather important down here. Looking at these three sketches, you can feel something quite uncharacteristic entering Freud's manner. What stands out most, perhaps, is the swift swoop of his drawing arm as he tries to define the arabesques of his friend's flanks. There's something not quite right about the results across the three drawings, but together they generate a fascinating little microclimate of contending weather, sexual, artistic, and personal, curiosity and trust, dare, and retreat. Emboldened by Freud's drawings of him, Bacon asked Freud to pose for him in his studio. The painting turned out to be the first named portrait in Bacon's oeuvre, and for this reason alone it's significant, because from the 1960s, when his reputation was peaking, by far the majority of Bacon's paintings were portraits of a small number of intimate friends, just as Freud's already were and would continue to be. What was unexpected about this first named portrait, although it set a pattern for the future, was that when Freud arrived, he found the painting of him already on the easel and almost finished. It turned out that in lieu of Freud himself, Bacon had used a visual trigger to help him, a photograph, as it happens, of a young Franz Kafka, used as a frontispiece for the first edition of Max Brod's biography of Kafka. What Kafka had to do with Freud is impossible to say and perhaps not really the point. It was a question instead of unconscious, almost random suggestion. The portrait barely hints at the lavish distortions and ardent injuries Bacon would later inflict on his subjects, all in an attempt to convey what he liked to call the brutality of fact. What mattered was, that it revealed, was what it revealed about Bacon's attitude to his subjects, an attitude that, for now at least, was completely at odds with Freud's. Bacon was very uh, open later about the fact that he found the actual presence of sitters in his studio distracting. He preferred to paint alone. This may be just my own neurotic sense, he later told David Sylvester, but I find it less inhibiting to work from them through memory and their photographs than actually having them seated there before me. The subject's presence inhibited him, he, inhibited him, he said, because, quote, if I like them, I don't want to practice before them the injury that I do to them in my work. I would rather practice the injury in private, by which I think I can record the fact of them more clearly. Bacon liked working from pre-existing photographs, but he also commissioned photographs of prospective subjects from his friend and drinking companion, John Deacon. To create the psychological effect of having encountered them at random, he liked to work from them after they'd been ripped or torn and allowed to settle like dead leaves into the trammeled mulch of his studio floor. 
Deacon's portrait photographs have the impact, said one friend, of a prison mugshot taken by a real artist. They were images, quote, to recoil from, brutal portraits, intimate close-ups of the face, emphasizing every blemish. Like most modern artists, Bacon was convinced he'd seen through what he saw as the lie of realism, even the kind of sophisticated urban realism invented by Degas and Manet in the latter half of the 19th century. Realism's pretense at disinterested truth-telling, its slavish fidelity to appearances, these things he believed were of dubious value in the more extreme 20th century. A conventional portrait could scarcely convey movement, let alone the whole gamut of psychological sensations, the, the human sense of mortality, let alone the, uh, sorry, the apprehension of futility and of the nightmare of recent history, all those things that Bacon saw as fundamental to the modern condition and therefore more real than appearances. He was obsessed by the question of how to communicate these things in paint. He spoke about distorting the image in an effort to bring about a greater sense of truth he prefers, said his friend John Russell, to bait the trap in such a way that conventional likeness at first seems excluded, only to be caught unawares at a later stage. Tell me, Bacon later said to, uh, tell me, sorry, he later asked Sylvester, who today has been able to record anything that comes across to us as a fact without causing deep injury to the image? Freud may have been influenced by this kind of talk, but he was still wedded to appearances. He remained adamant that appearances were connected to truth, or at least that the effort to record them as faithfully as possible carried its own charge of truth. And really, it was in this matter, the use of photography and the presence or otherwise of the sitter in the studio, that Freud put up his most strenuous resistance to Bacon's potentially overwhelming influence. For Freud, a great painting was always the record of a relationship in process. It was a transaction, as he later put it. It could go on for months, even years. This is a, a, a portrait of his very close and long, long friend, lifelong friend, Frank Auerbach. Um, duration was precisely what enriched it. Yes, the painter was ultimately in control, but the process demanded shifting degrees of domination and yielding from both parties. In a culture of photography, Freud would later say, we've lost the tension that the sitter's power of censorship sets up in the painted portrait. What mattered to Freud about painting in the presence of a model was, quote, the degree to which feelings can enter into the transaction from both sides. It wasn't until later that Freud articulated these instincts, but they were already at the core of his creative convictions. They were insights he had held close for years, ones that he knew he shouldn't let go of. But he sensed, in the way he acted on them, a limitation. He had an inkling, a, a useful one as it turned out, that Bacon's more radical approach might hold the key to overcoming it. When Freud convinced Bacon to sit for his small portrait, the idea, this at least is how he seems to have sold it, was to hang the finished work in Wheeler's, the Soho fish restaurant where Bacon liked to hold court. Despite a great deal of turmoil in his life at the time, Bacon was willing. The process took about three months, not particularly long, as Freud later acknowledged. His later portraits could take a year or more. Nonetheless, it was a trial for Bacon, who was temperamentally unsuited to posing. I can hardly sit down for long, he told Sylvester. It's one of the reasons I've suffered all my life from high blood pressure. People say, relax, what do they mean? I never understood this thing where people relax their muscles and they relax everything. I don't know how to do it. This simmering volatility is, of course, exactly what Freud manages to get over in the finished portrait. But getting the thing done can't have been easy for either artist or sitter. Freud sat so close to Bacon that their knees touched. All the while, Freud rested the copper plate on his lap. It was no doubt disorienting to both men that just as their own relationship reached a point of maximum intimacy and intensity, they found themselves embarking on amorous relationships that were to be the most important in many ways, the most destabilizing too in each of their lives. 
Caroline Blackwood was the love of Freud's life. Strangely, however, and despite their five-year love affair, Freud conceded later that Caroline remained to some extent impenetrable to him. It sounds ridiculous in a way, he told me, but I never really knew Caroline that well. Unlikely as it sounds, the claim is at least consistent. Freud cherished what was unknown and unknowable about people, even as he was constantly drawn to greater and greater extremes of intimacy. When you find something very moving, he once said, you almost want to know less about it. Rather like when falling in love, you don't want to meet the parents. Caroline's mother was the brewery heiress, Maureen Guinness. She'd never met someone as exotic and dangerous seeming as Lucien, wrote Ivana Lowell, her daughter. The fact that he was an outsider appealed to her, went on Lowell, and she saw in him an entree into a more bohemian world. Freud and Blackwood had a year in Paris, then returned to London. They were considered the most alluring, enigmatic couple in town. They lunched in Soho every day with bacon. And under the spell of Bacon's gusting sociability, life was rich, unpredictable, fraught with hilarity. They lived in a Georgian house on Dean Street, from where Freud would go to his Paddington studio every morning. Caroline bought Freud a sporty-looking car, and together they acquired an old priory in Dorset. Freud kept horses at the priory. He also kept a picture there by Bacon. It was based on Mybridge's photographs of wrestlers, but clearly showed two men making love on a bed. It was a painting Freud kept with him until his death, and though many requests came from museums, he never lent it out. Freud married Blackwood in 1953 when the divorce from Kitty came through. In 1954, they were again in Paris, but something was going wrong. It was a, a very cold winter in Paris. Blackwood was prone to depression and had started to drink. Her alcoholism, which blighted her adult life, began in earnest during these years. She later claimed that the main problem with their marriage was Freud's gambling. He'd started gambling under Bacon's influence. When a mutual friend asked Blackwood why her marriage to Freud had ended, she asked, have you ever driven with him? Yes, replied the friend. I was so terrified that when he stopped at a red light for once, I threw myself out. Exactly, came Blackwood's reply. That was what being married to him was like. It was Blackwood who left Freud rather than the other way around. She left their home one night and checked into a hotel. Freud was completely derailed. Nothing like this had happened to him before. Bacon was so concerned that he asked Charlie Lumley, a young Cockney neighbour who sat for Freud, to watch over him. I had to sort of babysit him for a while, Lumley later said. Actually, I think that was Bacon who later said that. Um, sorry. When I asked Freud why his friendship with Bacon had ended, he gave two separate accounts, one immediately after the other. The second story had the stale air almost of formula. It was a sort of complaint that crops up again and again in stories about rivalry. And regardless of the sad truth it holds, it can't help but sound petty. He said that when his own work started getting some notice, Bacon turned bitchy. What he really minded, Freud said, was that I started getting rather high prices. By then, he said, Bacon's character had, and I quote, changed quite a lot, which I think was to do with alcohol. It was impossible to disagree with him about anything. He wanted admiration, and he didn't mind where it came from. To some degree, he lost his quality. But Freud's other account of what had gone wrong was more surprising. The same year that Freud fell in love with Blackwood, Bacon met the lover who would have the most lasting and the most, in many ways, disastrous impact on his life. His name was Peter Lacey, and he was an ex-RAF Spitfire pilot who had fought in the Battle of Britain. His nerves, Bacon later claimed, were shattered as a result. The whole relationship, he said, was, quote, the most total disaster from the start. Being in love with someone in that extreme way, being totally physically obsessed by someone is like having some dreadful disease. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Lacey's vicious tantrums were violent in ways that Bacon could neither anticipate nor control. But this seems to have been precisely why he was drawn to them. He yearned for forms of intimacy that involved this loss of control, 
Freud struggled to get to grips with Bacon's relationship. The more deranged and violent Lacey became, the more Bacon seemed to love him. A crucial turning point came when Lacey, in one of his monstrous rages, threw Bacon through a window. Both men were drunk, which may have saved Bacon, no pun intended. Um, he fell 15 feet and survived, but his face was so badly damaged that his right eye had to be sewn back in place. When I saw Francis, Freud explained, one of his eyes was hanging out and he was covered in scars. I didn't really understand the relationship, he went on. After all, you don't. But I was so upset seeing him like this that I got hold of his Lacey's collar and twisted it around. Lacey didn't defend himself, he said, and the challenge fizzled out. The violence between them was a sexual thing, said Freud. I didn't really understand all this. The truth is, he told me, Francis really minded about this man more than anyone. Freud, it seems, didn't talk to Bacon for three or four years after that. Bacon had lost patience with his younger friend and seemed to consider him naive. A similar inference, an accusation of naivety, this time about art, was there in his later complaint about Freud's work being realistic without being real. Before he met Bacon, Freud had shown plenty of talent, but in his art, as perhaps in his life, he was still prone to sentimentality and a kind of adolescent wish fulfillment. In the cauldron of his relationship with Blackwood, which ended in bitter disappointment, and of his relationship with Bacon, who was then embroiled in an amorous relationship so extreme that it, it burned away the fat of sentimentality, Freud learned, besides many artistic lessons, the appeal of extremity obsession and ruthlessness. Freud later claimed that his early method was so arduous that there was no room for influence. But that changed when Bacon came on the scene. Bacon's influence touched everything. His company triggered many changes in Freud's life. It also triggered a slow burning crisis in his art. Not just in his method, but in his feeling about a subject matter and his fundamental sense of what for him was possible. Since before Kitty, Freud's goal in portraiture had been to convey intimacy. He'd figured that a uniform and painstaking fidelity to appearances could be enough to convey utmost absorption in his subjects. Now he wasn't so sure. Swayed in part by Bacon, he began to pay increasing attention to his sitter's three-dimensional presence. He seemed especially interested in bunches of muscle, pouches of fat, light reflecting oils on the skin, all those qualities that, gave such, that give such uncanny life to his painted portrait of Bacon. A new sense of amplitude entered into his pictures. The viewer's consciousness of an overweening, romantic and somewhat boyish style disappeared. But he was still unsatisfied. He only had to look at Bacon's work to realize he had to do more. My eyes were going completely mad, sitting down and not being able to move, he said. Small brushes, fine canvas, sitting down used to drive me more and more agitated. I felt I wanted to free myself from this way of working. The ensuing change was extreme. After his 1954 uh, portrait of Caroline in Paris, Freud stood up to paint and never sat down again. To paint, that is. Um, the story of the development of Freud's art, I just realized that sounded odd. <laughs> he did sit down. Uh, the story of the development of Freud's art, his increasingly aggressive attack on sentimentality, which caused so many people to find his portraits cruel and ruthless, is in many ways the story of his fight to keep his romantic susceptibility, his ingenuousness at bay. It's the story of a long struggle not to suppress but to contain his most intense feelings, feelings that arose from intimate obsession and prolonged proximity. The example of Bacon, profoundly unsentimental and yet at times for Freud uncomfortably theatrical, played a huge part in the transformation that now took place. If Bacon's was a model to emulate, it was also one to avoid. Freud put away his fine sable brushes and began to teach himself to paint with thicker hog's hair brushes and more viscous paint. He was trying to make his touch richer and more ambivalent, 
to make each contact between brush and canvas more of a gamble. I think that Francis's way of painting really helped me feel more daring, he explained. People thought and said and wrote that I was a very good draftsman, but my paintings were linear and defined by my drawing, and that, and that you could tell what a good draftsman I was from my painting. I thought, if that's at all true, I must stop. The idea of doing paintings where you're conscious of the drawing and not the painting just irritated me. So I stopped drawing for many, many years." Unquote. The shift was amazingly audacious. Freud had made his reputation, such as it was, almost entirely on the strength of his drawing. But now, under Bacon's influence, he stopped drawing entirely and began to loosen up his paintwork. He stuck to his incredibly slow and arduous way of working, but like Bacon, he incorporated chance and risk and utilized all the viscosity and latent energy of oil paint applied by brush. Focusing more on flesh now than on eyes and faces, he started seeing the human body as a kind of landscape of shifting, almost arbitrary volumes that dissolve and reform continuously, depending not so much on shifting light as on conditions of the skin and the movements of blood and bone and muscle and the fatty tissue beneath. His mature style, the Lucian Freud we know now, took years to develop. And many of the results in this intermediate period are intensely odd and awkward. But by the time he reached his 60s, people could no longer ignore what was coming out of his studio. Pitting himself against the cliche that, quote, the eyes are a window into the soul, Freud tended to paint his subjects either asleep or dead-eyed. He talked about treating the head as just another limb. And he lavished no more attention on his sitter's face, facial features than on their thighs, their fingers or their genitals. In this way, he undermined the whole tradition, a traditional idea of portraiture as a function both of psychology and social status. Instead, in his slow moving hands, it became a function of intimate scrutiny, the scrutiny that in Robert Hughes's phrase, bypasses, bypasses decorum while fiercely preserving respect. If the wanted poster Freud designed in an attempt to get his stolen portrait of Bacon back was a sort of joke, and I think it was. The, the idea of Bacon as a criminal at large and a nod, perhaps, to Deacon's mugshots taken by a real artist. It was also an immensely poignant one. It was an admission that not just this riveting painting, but this man, this crucial relationship, meant an enormous amount to him, and that somehow it had slipped through his fingers. Thank you very much. <laughs>